So here's where we're going today in the book of Ruth. The title of this message is Faithfulness in the Famine. In the very first verse of the book, we're told that there was a famine in the land. There was tragedy. There was there was a problem. And, and like every good story, uh, the book of Ruth has a has a conflict. It has a, a challenge. It has an obstacle to face. And it has a hero. And it has some love and romance. And and so at the very beginning, we're told, we're, we're confronted with the challenge that Ruth and Naomi faced. Uh, but here's where we're going. Here's the big idea for today. God faithfully cares for his people, and he sovereignly works out his good plans in their lives as they remain faithful to him. God faithfully cares for his people, and he sovereignly works out his good plans in their lives as they remain faithful to him. This truth brought me to tears this morning as we were singing it in, in the song uh, Cornerstone, uh, Sovereign Over Us. God is still working in our waiting, and he's still working through the brokenness and the struggle that we experience as the people of God. And, and what we'll see in the book of Ruth, that, that even the people of God face bitter, difficult circumstances. Even the people of God go through hardship. Even the people of God suffer loss and have to grieve and have to experience pain in this broken world. But the people of God don't do it alone. God is with us. God is for us. God is working through our circumstances. Amen. Ruth chapter 1. We're just going to read the first five verses there. In Ruth chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible... I got it up there on the screen for you. Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem in Judea went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of the wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Melion and Kilion. They were Ephrodites from Bethlehem in Judea. They went from the country of Moab and remained there, but Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These two Moabite wives, the, the name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both Malion, Malion and Kilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. So, so here's the problem, here's the challenge uh, Ruth and Naomi uh, were in some difficult circumstances. And, and the very first thing about their circumstances was this, that they lived in a very difficult time period. Okay, they lived in the time of Judges. Yesterday in our Bible reading plan, we just started the book of Judges. Judges 1, and, and chapter 1, chapter 2. By the way, if you're behind in your Bible reading plan, don't worry about it. Just 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 pick up where, on, on the day that we're on and just... Just keep trucking along. The aim of the Bible reading plan that we're doing this year is not to just get through the Bible this year, but we want to get the Bible in us this year. Okay? So just, just camp out right, right where we're at. Don't, don't feel like you have to cram and catch up and, uh, unless you just, you know, really feel like it's important for you to read through the entire Bible, which I think that's great. I think that's very good. It's a good goal. But listen to it in your car while you're driving to or from work or something if you want to catch up. So, so here's the deal. So the challenge that Naomi and Ruth had was, first of all, they were living in dark times. In the book of Judges, we see, here's, here's just a snapshot. Here's a summary of what was going on in the book of Judges. Judges 2, 11 through 12. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of the fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they went after other gods from among the gods of the people who were around them. And they bowed down to them and they provoked the Lord to anger. So there is this cycle throughout the book of Judges. This was a very dark, difficult time in the history of Israel. We taught on Wednesday night, Pastor Mike taught on Judges not too long ago. And I think some of us who were here, as we looked at the book of Judges, Judges just kind of felt like, ah, oh, this is depressing. You know, it's just like, where's the hope in this book? You know, and so I, I don't want to just leave us without hope today, but I, I do want us to see that life is full of bitter, ch- challenging 
circumstances that will come our way. And God is amazing at taking those bitter circumstances and making them sweet. God is amazing at doing that. So a little bit more, just in Judges 2, 16 through 17, uh, after Israel would turn away from God, the, the Lord would, would raise up judges who would save them out of the hand of those who plundered them, yet they did not listen to their judges. For they, they whored after other gods and bowed down to them, and they soon turned aside to the way in which their fathers had walked, not obeyed the commandments of the Lord, and they did not do so. Whoever, whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was, was with, with the judge, and he saved them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge, for the Lord was moved by pity, moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. So there was this cycle in the book of Judges where they would, they would turn away from God, they would go after other gods, and God would bring punishment because they would turn their back on God. They would not be faithful to God. And then they would cry out in their distress, in their struggle, in their groaning. They would cry out, God. And God would raise up a judge. He would raise up a deliverer, a savior, and deliver them out of the hands of their enemies because he was moved with pity. He was moved with compassion for his people. Okay? So Ruth and Naomi were living in this time, as one theologian says, that the book of Ruth is, is, a, is, is a diamond in the dung. A diamond in the dunk. In the midst of these dark, difficult, challenging days, there is this beautiful little story of this little family, this small family, and this beautiful story of redemption. And who knows how many more of these little stories of redemption were taking place, even in the most difficult of times. God is doing so much more than we are able to see that he's doing on the surface. There are many little stories of redemption that where God is working through a family in some poor family in a village in in Africa and he's working this beautiful story of redemption that we have no idea about and there's there's hundreds and thousands of these little stories of people who are trusting God clinging in the God being faithful to God through the famine through the flood through the fire through disaster and God is providentially bringing about his good plans in their life. And the book of Ruth is that. God, in, in the midst of a dark time in history, God was working a plan of redemption for Ruth and Naomi. Okay, this should encourage us, by the way, for the, those of us who are discouraged about the days that we live in, the, the political unrest, uh, social unrest, and uh, the spiritual unrest. That was the case then for Ruth and Naomi. And God was able to bring about redemption even through that and in the midst of that. And he can do that in our lives as well. The other thing was there was a famine in the land. Okay, so Amalek and his and Naomi, his wife Naomi, and then their sons, they moved from the house of Bethlehem. They moved from Bethlehem, the, city, the place of Bethlehem, to uh, Moab. And so Bethlehem, that what Bethlehem means is house of bread or place of food, okay? That's the meaning of, of Bethlehem, okay? So they left Bethlehem. They left the promised land, a place in the promised land, the land that God had for his people where God said he would bless his people. And they went to a place called Moab, a place where there were enemies of God, a place where the women in Moab had seduced uh, um, the men of Israel. And, and, and the Moabites originated from the um, ancestral relationship between Lot and his daughters. Okay? And so they were, they were enemies of Israel. And so you might say that Moab was like a land of compromise. And so they left, they left the, the, the promised land the place, uh, to, to a place, a land of compromise, if you will. Kinda, it's kind of like playing with fire. You know, yet we're not told in this that, that God was uh, was judging the family or, or uh, there's there's no indication within that in, within this book that God was judging Ruth or Naomi or punishing punishing them in any way. Actually, we see the opposite in, in the story. God was was actually bringing about good and, and working for them on their behalf. Now, we do have some text in the Old Testament, I think Le- Leviticus 26 and a couple of other places that talks about God's punishment. And one of the expressions of his punishment was 
was famine, where God just kind of turns off the spigot. When Israel turns away from God, and then there's no rain, and then there's no food, and, and, and times get really tough. But that's not always the case. A famine or a natural disaster isn't always God's judgment. So we should be careful when we when we kind of put God in a box in that way, and we say, who sinned? Was it this man or his parents that sinned? And God's like, it was neither. It was that the glory of God might be revealed this day. You know, we, we, we can make the same mistake as, as the disciples did when we when we have this kind of narrow, narrow thinking. Um, so anyways, so there's a natural disaster. And as I mentioned last week, this is one of the causes of poverty. So poverty is a complex issue. It's not always just somebody's lazy and they're not working. Uh, it's, it's, it's not always that they're just evil systems and injustice holding people down while those things are true. And, and those are it, issues when it comes to poverty. There are also things that are out of the box, out of our control that happen in our life that come our way that completely catch even the best of us off guard, like a natural disaster, like a famine in the land. And so this is what Ruth and Naomi were facing. This was the challenge they were facing. And then on top of that, they, their, their husbands died. So Elimelech, the, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with two sons. And then they took two wives from the, of the Moabite women. So they married the Moabite women. Uh, and the names of one was Orpah and the other one was Ruth. And then Ruth. And then, and then the, the sons died. And so there was about, let's see, uh, ten years. So there was about ten years. No children. Okay, no children. So they, they were married for about 10 years, and then there's no children. For, for a woman in, in ancient Israel, in, in ancient history, that was not a good thing at all. That was seen as a curse, as a really bad thing for a woman not to be able to have children. You see, having children was, was, was so valuable and so important because they didn't have, like, social security Right back in their day where, um, you know, there's this system set up to take care of you where you can retire and get retirement and some kind of funding. Their children were their social security in a sense, right? The children would then take care of the, el- of the parents and, and then the children would also carry on the name of the family. Okay, so that the family name would continue to live on. And so this was seen as a really bad thing to be left with, with no children. And, and so, and then, what that meant for the husbands dying was it meant that they, these became widows. Naomi and Ruth became widows. That means they lacked provision. They lacked a, a man in the house who would provide for them. They lacked protection. They became vulnerable to all kinds of attacks. They, and then they lacked, they lacked family. There was a, probably a sense of loneliness this was, I, I want us to get this, this was a very difficult circumstance. If anybody's ever lost a loved one, you know that it's painful, especially when they're really close loved ones. So I lost my brother when I was 13 years old. He was a 10-year-old boy and was hit by a car and killed. And I lost my father when I was 15 years old. And so, so those were two family relationships that were really close. And I watched my mom try to cope with the loss of my brother and she became like Naomi. She became bitter. She became hurt and bitter. And, and thankfully, God brought, we came to Christ, and God brought redemption, and God brought healing. But many people don't know how to deal with the grief of loss in a healthy way. Like me and my mother, what we did was we, we turned the drugs, and we tried to cope by just numbing it, stuffing it, and just not talking about it, or, or just, you know, just try, or at least that was my my way of coping just kind of stuffing it and and don't think about it don't talk about it forget about it and just move on but that's not healthy you know because you store all that in inside these were some of the challenging challenges that ruth and naomi were facing they didn't they didn't have husbands they didn't have provision they didn't have protection and then they were they were in the land of of moab okay they were they were out of the promised land so the bible tells us that god cares for the poor the orphans, and the widow. Deuteronomy 10, 18 through 19, says that God, he executes justice for the fatherless and the widow. And he loves the sojourner, giving them food and clothing. Love the sojourner, therefore, for you are sojourners in the land of Egypt. Psalm 68, 5 and 6. God is a father to the fatherless and a protector of widows. 
is, is God in his holy habitation. God settles the solitary in a home, and he leads out the prisoners to prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a parched land. When Ruth and Naomi were left without a protector and a provider in the home, God protected. God provided. God providentially worked and covered them and sheltered them even through the difficult time. Okay, so now let's let's go a little bit further in the story here from verse 6. We'll pick up in verse 6. So then Ruth arose with her daughters-in-laws and to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she sent out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judea. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go return, each of you, to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to, said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet have I yet sons in my womb that may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait until they are grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And then they lifted up their voices and they wept. And Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And so I love, I love this story. This is a great story. Here's, here's conflict. Here's uh, this, this, we have the inside of this, this conversation here with Ruth and Naomi. And Ruth, Naomi's telling Ruth, and Orpah, by the way, um, Oprah was named after Orpah. Oprah Winfrey, the talk show host. Okay. So Naomi tells them to just go. She's like, I, I can't have any more kids. You know, even if, I, even if I did, even if I had some kids, are you going to wait and marry them? So they, they wept. I love this. They wept. So there's this very emotional, raw moment. I love this about the Bible is the Bible doesn't, just gloss over or, or, or whitewash or cover up some of these difficult circumstances that the people of God face. They wept. There is a time to weep. There is a time to grieve. There is a time to, to let the grief process take place within you. Uh, Ecclesiastes 7 verse 3 says, um, Ecclesiastes 7 verse 3 says, Sorrow is better than laughter. By the sadness of face, the heart is made glad. You see, there's a time, there's a time to not just put on a smile because you, you need to put on a smile for folks and tell everybody you're okay, I'm doing well, when you're really not doing well. It's okay to not be okay. There are times when it's okay to not be okay. And we, we need to be real with one another and be able to weep and grieve with one another in a healthy way. Naomi says that, that, that God was, uh, has dealt with her bitterly or God's hand was against her. Okay? This is how she felt. She was very real. She was very honest about how she felt. And many times when we're going through loss and we're going through suffering, we feel the same way. We feel the same way. And there are two foundational truths that we need to hold on to when we're going through loss and suffering and difficulty and trials in our lives. We need to hold on to the reality that God is sovereign. Okay, This didn't just like catch God off guard. God wasn't surprised by this. He's great. He's, he's the almighty. He's sovereign. Ruth seems to have a grasp of that. God's dealt me a really bitter, bitter lot in life. Okay, so, so she seems to recognize that, but it seems that she's struggling with the other side, that God is, God is good and merciful, God, that God was really for her. At least that's how she felt. She was honest about it. You know, we need to be honest with, with, with our, with our, in our grief, and that's actually one of the ways that we find healing. 
through grieving loss is just being honest and, and, and recognizing that. So within this, this, um, this difficulty, this challenge, we see the commitment of, of Ruth to Naomi. Verse 15. And she said, see your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. Your God, my God. And where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me. And more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. So she just she just let her stay. So we got two people here, two daughter-in-laws. By the way, this is often used in weddings. Uh, your people shall my, be my people. Your God shall be my God. And I think that's it's a beautiful it's a be, some beautiful verses for commitment. And when you're at a wedding and making a wedding covenant, you're making a commitment before one another, husband and wife. But I've never never heard that commitment being made to in-laws at a wedding. <laughs> Where you go, I'm going to go. Where Your people shall be my people. Your God will be my God. There's a, it's actually like you're leaving father and mother, and you're, you're clinging to your husband or wife, right? And actually, this is the same, this is the same word, that clinging uh, in Genesis 2. Uh, that's the same word used. Um, Ruth clang to her mother-in-law. That's all they had. All they had was each other. Well, they had the Lord. But then they had each other. They had each other through the difficult time. And how refreshing and comforting it is to have committed relationships when you are in the famine, in the fire, in the flood, and everything seems painful and difficult. And you got people who are just holding on, and they're going to stay there with you. They're going to walk there with you. They're going to cling to God with you and band together, unite together, and stand through the difficult time. How comforting it is to have brothers and sisters who will do that. Now, now Ruth's commitment, Ruth's commitment to, was not only to Naomi. But it is, it was also to her God. You see, Orpah, she went back to her family and she went back to her family's gods. Okay? That's not necessarily a good thing. Right? So Ruth didn't want to go back. You know, last Sunday we had baptisms. A baptism. Thomas Davis got baptized and I asked him why he wants to get baptized. And he says to follow Jesus. And he said, no turning back. And we sang that after the baptisms. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Okay, this is what disciples of Jesus Christ do. They follow him. They are committed with the same kind of commitment to God and to one another. And they're going to follow Jesus to the cross. Because that's the way of Christianity. You deny yourself, you take up a cross. The problem is we have a whole generation of looking for comfort and looking to avoid the cross. Yet God calls us to bear our cross. And we see on this godly woman, Ruth, we see that as she remains faithful, not only to Naomi, but to God in a sense here. She's committing to, to God, to worship the one true God, the God of Israel, Yahweh. And she takes up his name, and she even, she even says, you know, may God punish me. May God, may, if, if I don't, if I do leave, uh, may, may the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. She makes an oath in the name of Yahweh, the one true God. She makes an oath that she's going to stick with Naomi through the difficult times. This is beautiful. And I think we can learn a lot from this because our culture and what we see within our culture is we see people who cut and run whenever the heat gets turned up. When it comes to a job, when it comes to a relationship, when it comes to a church, when it comes to whatever. I mean, we're, we're so flaky in this generation. 
You know, our culture is so flaky. And Ruth is not a flaky woman. She is a woman of substance. She is a worthy woman. She's a woman of character. And what we see is we see as she's faithful to to Naomi and God, God is faithfully working on her behalf to bring about good. Amen? She was in the right place at the right time, and we're not there yet because this actually looks like the wrong place to be. Right? This There's not a lot of promise with Ruth following Naomi. There's really not. And Ruth tells her that. And Orpha's like, okay, you convinced me. I'm out of here. See you later. She's gone. Orpha's gone. Okay? Remember, Jesus had this same kind of thing happen when he was preaching and he was making disciples in in John chapter 6. And he started saying some hard things like, you know, I'm the bread of life. And unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life within you. And, And they're like, man, we're out of here. This guy's crazy. And then Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, do you guys want to leave also? And, and I love Peter. I love the response. He says, Lord, we, we have come to know and believe you're the Holy One of God. Uh, where else can we go? Who, who else has the words of eternal life? We don't have any, any place to go. We've burned the bridges. We've left our families. We've left our businesses. We've left all to follow you. We're staking our life on you, Jesus. And that's the kind of commitment. That disciples of Jesus Christ make. We're committed to him. We're committed to one another. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. You are God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And I will be buried there with you. And may the Lord do so also. Do to me and mourn also if anything but death separates me from you. So we see this beautiful commitment. And, and God blesses Naomi for this. I mean blesses Ruth for this commitment. Um, Verse 19 through 21, so the two of them went until it came to Bethlehem, until they came to Bethlehem, and they came to Bethlehem, and the whole town was stirred because of them, and the woman said, is this Naomi? Is this Naomi? Like, she left with her husband and her sons. She left full, as she says, Naomi says, and she said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara. She's just, she's very, she's very honest, she's straight up. She says, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi's name meant pleasant. And so Naomi comes back, and there's, hey, Naomi, hey, pleasant. Her name means pleasant. She's like, I'm not pleasant right now. And there is honest grief pain and loss that she experienced and and she says hey just call me mara i'm i'm bitter god has given me a bitter lot in life this is hard this is tough and like i said ecclesiastes 7 7 3 you know it's it's healthy for us not to deny the pain and the grief that we experience not to suppress it and stuff it sorrow is better than laughter by sadness of face the heart is made glad you know there's there's it's good, there's a time for mourning, and it's good to mourn when it's that time. It's good to grieve over that loss. But then at some point, you've got to get up, and you've got to move on past that grief. Amen? But right now is their time to grieve. And, and those of us who minister to our brothers and sisters who are going through a time of grief and loss and suffering, let's, let's, be, let's be sensitive and make sure we give them their space to grieve in that time. Let's give them their space to grieve. It's okay to not be okay when your husband dies. Okay? Grieve for a season. It's okay to not be okay when your son dies, your brother dies, your sister dies. Okay? When you've just been diagnosed with with cancer. Now, as Christians, though, we grieve not as those without hope. Amen? So we grieve, and we should grieve, and let that process take place. Let that... You know, express that pain, pour out that your heart to God, uh, but but know that there is hope, and so we want to give people that space in their grieving, but also we want to give people hope and comfort and just be there, just be there in those those times of of difficulty and suffering. And so Naomi was honest about her grief and suffering. I hate to finish here because this uh, the story gets really good from here. Okay. Actually, I'm not going to finish here. I'm going to keep going. 
Okay, here's a quote I, I, I found, a great quote. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. You may not feel like God's smiling on you when you're going through suffering and loss and pain and grief. But know that he has, he has promised he delights in us. He is for us. He is with us. He's never going to forsake us. And in the book of Ruth, we not only see the faithfulness of Ruth, in the faithfulness of Boaz, but we see the faithfulness of God ultimately working to provide, to protect his people. Amen? And so the story goes on. So then this guy Boaz comes into the sto- into the the on the scene, chapter 2. And Boaz, I believe his name means in whom is strength. Okay? So there's this Boaz guy, and this Boaz guy... Uh, uh, is is kind of like the, one of the heroes of the story. This guy, he is a, a picture of covenant faithfulness. He's opening his hand to the poor, opening his heart to the poor. He sees he sees um, Ruth and Naomi, and well, he sees Ruth, and and he he lets her glean in the field, as we talked about last week. One of the ways that God made provision for the poor is to, to he he told the people of Israel, don't glean, don't Harvest the fields all the way up to the edges. Leave some space for the poor so that they can get some food from the edges of the field. And so Boaz did that. Uh, Naomi had a relative of, of her husband, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech. By the way, Elimelech, the name Elimelech means uh, God is king. And this is interesting because we're, we're introduced to him at the very beginning of the story. And this is a theme throughout the book of Ruth. God is sovereign. God is king. Though it doesn't seem like he's in charge and he knows what's going on, he's king. He is sovereign. So so uh, a worthy man of Elimelech whose name was Boaz and Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean from the ears of the grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to him, go my daughter. So she set out so she set out and went and gleaned from the field in the field of the reapers, and and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. Now, this, if you if if you know a little bit about what what the Bible says in in the Old Testament about the kinsman redeemer and and some of the the deal set up for provision for those who have lost loved ones, this is important. Um, this is important for Ruth and Naomi because this guy Boaz can redeem Ruth and, and their property and, and he can help in the situation. So, and behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered, the Lord bless you. And then Boaz said to the young, young man who is in charge of the reapers, who is this young, who is this woman, this young woman? All right. He's like, whoa, check her out. Okay. Who is this woman? The servant and the servant who was in charge of the reaper said, she is a young Moabite woman. Okay, that probably like, oh, Moabite woman. You know, he's probably, okay, okay, yeah. Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country. And she said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. And she said, and she came and she continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. By the way, Ruth was a hard worker. All right. She was working hard. Okay, to, to get the food that, that it was provided for, but she had to go and get it. She had to go and glean it from the field. And then Boaz said to Ruth, now listen, my daughter, do not go and glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. So, so here's Boaz saying, hey, just stay in this field right here. Okay, There's, there will be protection and provision right here. And here, here's where we see God protecting and providing Ruth. And Naomi, let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? You see, a widow, especially a Gentile widow working in the field was vulnerable to attacks and vulnerable to be misused and abused. And Boaz is saying, hey, don't don't mess with her. Okay, let let her glean in the field. 
And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink, and the young, drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes, that you should take notice of me, since I'm a foreigner? But Boaz answered, All you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and mother and your native land, and you came to a people that you did not know, the Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge in. Ruth not only clung to Naomi, and it was committed to Naomi, but she clung to the God of Israel, and she took refuge in the God of Israel, the one true God, the one, the only one who can sovereignly work about her circum through her circumstances and bring about her good. And then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. And it goes on. But I, I want to finish. I'm going to land right here and finish on this verse that, that she took refuge. Boaz says, you've come under the wings, un, under the God of Israel, under his wings to take refuge. God is a refuge for the poor. He's a refuge for the poor. He lifts up the poor and the needy from the ash heap. And he makes them to sit with princes, the scripture says. God cares for the poor, for the widow, for the fatherless. And all who take refuge in him will find shelter, will not be forsaken, will will find his hand of deliverance upon them, for them, working through them and, and on their behalf. And so we see Ruth being faithful in the famine, faithful to God, faithful to Naomi. And now we see God starting to bless her, provide and protect, and you read a little bit further, and you'll see that she gets hitched, all right? This is, this is a romantic, redemptive story, a story of romance and redemption, all right? So, ladies, if you like chick flicks and you like these kind of stories, just get into it and just let it, let it scratch that itch of redemption and know that God is the ultimate romancer. The, the greatest lover who is faithful and he will never let you down and he is after your heart and he wants all your heart and you can rightfully give it to him and he won't break it into pieces because he's faithful. He's sovereign and he's good. Amen. So take refuge under the shadow of his wings. Find rest in him. Know that bitter circumstances, we're, we're closing here. Know that, worship team, come on up. Know that bitter circumstances come upon God's faithful people. It will happen. You can expect trials and tragedy to come. And we can grieve the loss and, and go through it, but we can do it with hope. Because God is our redeemer. God is our refuge. And then we should be faithful to God and others that he's placed in our lives during the difficult times. You see, it's in the difficult times that we're tempted to cut and run from God. And we're tempted to cut and run from one another. So there's these pressures and difficult times that come in our life. And it's in those times we're tempted to just cut and run like this. This is, doesn't feel good. I just want to get away. I just want to go get comfort like Orpha. Now, and we're not, the, 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 the author of Ruth doesn't, doesn't condemn her for her choice of leaving, but, but we want to be like Ruth. May God raise up Ruth's women who are like Ruth here at City Church, who are women of character and excellence, faithful, consistent, hardworking, women that have substance, who aren't flaky and shallow, but who are committed, committed to their husbands, committed in, in their jobs, committed to their children, committed to their church, committed to their community and their family. And let's trust that God is working out his good plans as we commit ourselves to him. Psalm, we'll close with this, Psalm 37, 5. Commit your way to the Lord and trust him. He will act. Commit your way to the Lord and trust him. He will act. He's faithful through the fire and through the flood. And he will work things together for our good. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you are faithful, sovereign, and you're good. 
you're holding on to us and you'll, you'll never let us go. Through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with us. You're for us. You, you comfort us. You guard us and you guide us. And you bring us through. And so God, we look to you. We, we cling to you. And may we be those who are committed to you and committed to one another. Even through the most difficult times, may we help each other get through the most difficult times in our lives as we face dark days ahead. May we be faithful as we put our faith and trust in you.